Hello, everyone. I have returned to continue discussing the greatest mystery of the century. Who is Pyramus's character in Beauty and the War? It's been a while since I've made a video, but I've taken my vacation for the year and I'm all settled back in. So today, we're going to delve even deeper into this rabbit hole to discuss clues, new and old, that have been put out there. <laughs> now, why doesn't my little kitten run from me? Does she not know that a scoundrel far worse than I would have defiled her? That's exactly it. You don't know what these hands that are touching you have done. What unforgivable things. But I don't want to let you. Reason, clawing at the front door, begging to be unleashed. And it was the door, darling. I would absolutely kill to have my way with you. Once again, we're discussing our mysterious friend Pyramus. We may not be able to see his eyes but we're not necessarily going to focus on that today. Rather, we're going to look into his mind. As shown in the other video, there were a couple posts made some time ago describing his counterpart in Beauty and the War. In them, there are two words that stand out to me. Madness and genius. Why these two words in particular? Many think of madness as someone who is insane or has completely lost their mind. Indeed, Madness can be extremely dehabilitating, reducing a person to a straitjacket, emitting nothing but incoherent babbling at best. But that is only one dimension of madness, one outcome of numerous. Many make the mistake of always associating the level of madness with that of intelligence. After all, madness is a defect of the mind, and can make those who suffer from it more prone to violent outbursts and lack of empathy. There are also certain mental illnesses that do affect intelligence levels, such as mental retardation, among others. However, in many cases, this is quite the contrary. There are a plethora of examples where people deemed mad had extremely high levels of intelligence. No, I came because I wanted to. People will say we're in love. You were telling me the truth back in Baltimore, sir. Please continue now. Well, I've read the case files, have you? Everything you need to find him is right there in those pages. And tell me how. First principles, Clarice. Simplicity. Read Marcus Aurelius of each particular thing. Ask, what is it in itself? What is its nature? What does he do, this man you seek? What is the first and principal thing he does? What needs does he serve by killing? Anger. Um, social acceptance and uh, sexual frustration. Sir. No, he covets. That is his nature. So, how does this relate to Pyramus? Well, let's look at the theories that have been posted recently on the official Tumblr page. It was also stated that these may or may not be true, not confirming anything. Obviously, this is all just general speculation. Even so... He couldn't be all those things at once. Or could he? No one's allowed to make fun of me anymore. <laughs> Thank you, Hedwig. Everything's fine now. Kevin went no grub. Kevin is asleep. 
We've made him sleep far away. You can call his name all you like, dear, but he's not going to hear you. The beast has shared with us his dream of a larger group to sustain him. No. Ten to twelve unworthy young next time. No. This is just the start. With every response about his identity, the answer is almost always the same. He can't wait for you to see who he is in Beauty and the War. Many times, he simply smiles and tells his fans that he will be whatever you want him to be. There may be a reason for this. This being that he can literally become whomever you want him to be. And why is that? Pyramus has schizophrenia. Lucky you say. Whoa, whoa, whoa! This is way out there, I know. But hear me out. Realistically, there have been many studies done to link intelligence levels to schizophrenia, thus concluding that there is a strong chance of a correlation. It makes sense. The mind must be a powerhouse to fabricate alternate personalities and things that are not physically present to be mistaken as real. This is, of course, something that can be severely damaging to a person's psyche, or indicate such. Let's look at a very recent post where the men of Beauty and the War reacted in scenarios with Ambrosia based off of a song chosen by them, <laughs> by moi. If we look at Pyramus' scene, two things stood out to me in this post. First, he never chooses to talk about himself, always more inclined to give you the stage to speak about yourself. Learning about a person can give one power over them if they are intense or malicious. And this may not even be for potential lovers. In other recent posts, where Pyramus is interacting with other characters, though he makes his opinions known, he lets them do all the talking. As if he is a questioner or interviewer. Quid pro quo, I tell you things, you tell me things. Not about this case, though, about yourself. Quid pro quo, yes or no. Go out. What is your worst memory of childhood? Death of my father. You're very frank, Larise. I think it would be quite something to know you in private life. Quid pro quo, Doctor. Why does he place them there, Doctor? The significance of the moth is change. Caterpillar into chrysalis or pupa from thence into beauty. This allows Pyramus to remain a mystery, exactly what he needs to be. In addition, if he does in fact have schizophrenia or a related mental illness, I can imagine that his true self is lost under all the masks, the personalities, the imitations of people real and imaginary. Maybe he does not talk about himself because he has lost touch with who he really is. The second line that stood out to me in this post is very important to this theory. You are tired now? Let us put you to bed, darling. In this sentence, rather than say, let me put you to bed, he says, let us put you to bed. The use of a plural to describe himself, though a small slip-up, could actually be a huge indication that this theory is true, among other clues I have mentioned as well as a couple more I will discuss. Going back to the theories post, perhaps there is a possibility that you could deal with any of those scenarios and more at any given time. One night, he could be the troubled man, but when you wake up in the morning, he could be someone else. That leads me to a slightly terrifying thought I have. Remember when the trailer for the Valentine's Day special series was released a couple years ago? There is one line that stuck out to me. Many of you think that he, referring to arsenic, could be Blanket Guy. Let's flip this sentence around for a moment. What if instead, Blanket Guy could be arsenic? Well, isn't that the same exact thing? Not at all. We're not dealing with a simple math problem here. I don't think that this is a question of whether or not Unknown is arsenic or is Victor 
or any other character we have speculated thus far. It's a question of whether or not he can be them. What do I mean by this? Let's look back at this post. We go to sleep, and the last thing we see is Pyramus. But in these scenarios, we wake up with either Arsenic, Victor, or Onyx. But do we really? Say that his counterpart in Beauty and the War has what modern science would call schizophrenia, or perhaps some sort of obsessive-compulsive disorder. This is what causes some to warn against ever encountering him, as shown in the other video. If, in fact, he is a holder, he may know Arsenic and Victor. He would see them interact with Ambrosia, beginning to understand their personal traits through observation and other methods. Then, he could turn around and imitate them down to a T once he's learned enough about them. From their mannerisms, the way they speak, act, write, and behave, he could virtually become other people around him. Imagine this. Ambrosia receives a note from Arsenic, never penned by his hand. She could hear Victor calling out her name from behind a tree in the woods that he never uttered. And when she answers their call, it would be Pyramus waiting for her instead. Much like how the wolf lured Red Riding Hood by the sound of her grandmother's voice in the clothes she wore. After all, have you ever wondered why you have the option of choosing different voices at the beginning of Don't Take This Risk? Like he has said before, he can be anything you want him to be. But this does not mean that he is even fully in control of himself. And if he is in fact mentally unsound, diagnosed with a disorder, or has unpredictable personality swings, and even the propensity for criminal insanity, then you are truly taking a risk if you stay the night with him. There is a chance that beneath all this, there is truly a man that just wants love. He wants to give his heart to someone and receive another in return. But if this theory is correct, there are many dark layers to bypass before that part of him can be reached. So, what do you think? Could this theory be true? Let me know your thoughts in a comment, and don't forget to share with Crown Ruler or Poison Apple Tales as well. In addition, fans of Beauty and the War can now check out the new fan blog on Tumblr. I'll leave a link to that in the description. In the meantime, we can only wait to see what Pyramus has to say next and hope that our lives aren't the cost of our curiosity. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!